You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Rish Outfield and Big Anklevich. Feliz Navidad. Well, why, thank you. Are we on? We are. Well, uh, uh, Feliz Navidad. Welcome to the Dune Steef Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 1, number 2, page 74. This is one of your hosts, Rish Outfield. Another of your hosts, Big Anklevich. And the last host... R-080T. Come on, be charitable. Come on. I'm, I'm, I'm trying. Uh, well, we've got a story for you tonight. That's right. And it is Rampion in the Bell Tower by Mary Haskell. About the author. Hi, I'm Mary Haskell. I live in southeastern Michigan with my husband, stepdaughter, and 47 pounds of cats. My story, Rampion in the Bell Tower, was published in the first issue of Le Bon Fay earlier this year. My fiction has also appeared in Asimov's and Strange Horizons, and also on the podcasts Escape Pod and Podcastle. My webpage can be found at maryhaskell.com. Rampion in the Bell Tower by Mary Haskell On the third day of the plague, no priests emerged from hiding to perform mass consecration and burial as they had on the previous mornings. The hot sun rose to silence, and silence reigned in the square below, while corpses rotted and pools of blood dried. In the shadows, the plague dead slept. I wish I could ring a peal, Rampion said, standing beside her grandfather in the lunette window's tall arch. It was not the first time she had said this since sealing the brass doors of the Campanile. Perhaps tomorrow, Rampion, the grandfather lied. Perhaps, Grandpa she said, answering lie with lie. Neither of them would ring the bells again. The water was gone, finished that very morning. Take me to the western parapet, Ramp, the grandfather said, not adding, Why, you can still carry me. They sat quietly in the shade of the bell tower, staring up at the cloudless sky and the wheeling birds until the sun topped the campanile and bathed them with hot, candescent light. I wish it would rain... Rampion said, her voice as high and fragile as a child's. She fanned herself with one hand and held her heavy hair off her neck with the other. She did not look like a child any more, but rather like a revenant of her mother. Rampion, inheritor of her mother's dark hair and dark eyes, showed no sign of inheriting her mother's dark arts. Once the grandfather had prayed that she would not turn to witchery and abandon his bell tower, but that was before the plague. Now he wished for many things he had prayed against before. I wish you had gone with Simon, he said. No, you don't. You wouldn't have had to marry him. She laughed. Not marry him? When brave, strong Simon rescued me from the blood death, would I have been allowed to be so ungrateful? His mother would have finished sewing my veil before we passed the city walls. Her gallows humor brought tears to the grandfather's eyes. She squeezed his still strong hands. I wish I had wings to fly us away from here, she whispered. He said, You should not have stayed for me. She embraced him quickly and laughed into his ear. Grandpa, I stayed for the bells. He could not hide the comfort this gave him, and she smiled. And when the prince returns for his mother, you and I will ring the bells together, and he'll know we are here and ride to our rescue. The prince had been far from his capital when the blood plague descended. And the grandfather did not think the young man would risk himself even for his mother. But he had no wish to dash the girl's dream with his cynicism, not when she had stayed for him. She moved his chair to the slit lancet window in the clavier room, then went to the eastern parapet to stare for a while at the city gate. The gate never opened, despite her fervent prayers. When dusk settled, the smoke of the cooking fires rose once more to the high windows of the tower, and the screams of the Eaton began again. The grandfather woke from a nap with his hands dancing across his lap. He had dreamed of beating the batons and making the bells sing. Rampion left the window where she watched the feasts of the plague dead, 
and seated herself on the floor beside her grandfather, resting her damp cheek against his benumbed knee. He stroked her hair until she fell into a troubled sleep, watching over the bonfires that stained the night orange. Near midnight, a sound from the western parapet froze the grandfather's blood. Please, God. His prayer stopped there. He did not know how to continue, and he was certain that one of the plague dead had scaled the tower to devour them. The grandfather's muscles gathered and bunched, but the strength faded away before it came. He had not walked in ten years, but sometimes his legs forgot just for a moment. Clack, clack. At the entrance to the parapet, the shape of a tall white bird appeared, standing with one wing extended. A stork. Hi! The grandfather cried, but the bird did not fly away. It strode over to him, staring into his face. Then, like Rampion, and Rampion's mother before her, the bird knelt and rested her cheek against his knee. Go thou? He whispered. He reached out, brushing the bird's crest with his fingertips. She turned dark, bright eyes to him, double-clacking her beak. Oh, my daughter, he said, his voice breaking. The bird clacked again. He nodded. I forgot. Storks are mute. He contemplated her feathered head for a moment, then muttered, Muteness is very inconvenient in a messenger from beyond the grave. His daughter flew into the rafters and tucked her head beneath one wing to sleep. Rampion's gasp woke the grandfather. Careful, Grandpa. There's a bird in the rafters waiting to peck out our eyes. I will carry you to the room above and then shoo it out with the broom. The grandfather grinned. Stay your broom, soldier, and live in peace. Storks bring good luck. Luck? The only luck that bird could bring right now is a fine stork dinner. Or an egg dinner, if she's laid any. Bite your tongue. We'll do no such thing with a kind mother and her little stork looking down on us. He raised a finger to the ceiling, referencing the two youngest bells of the carillon, installed when he was still an apprentice bell ringer. Rampion subsided, then looked around helplessly. It was the time of day to break their fasts, to go down to the well, to drink to Zahn's. And she did not seem to know what to do with herself. She went to the wide crescent-topped windows and stared down into the square. All was quiet again. Perhaps I could run to the well, she began. But almost as she spoke, a raven landed below and plucked at the eyes of a body. From the shadows, one of the plague dead leaped for the raven, caught it, and devoured the bird, feathers and all. Rampion grimaced and drew away, going to sit beside the grandfather and to lean against his shoulder for comfort. He patted her head and told her of the great fidelity and devoted parenting of storks and of the day when the great bulk of the two newest bells were installed in the Campanile. Then together they recited the names of the twenty-seven bells of the carillon, first in order of tone and weight, then in order of age, and then, taking turns, each by how much they favored the bells' names. Then they fell silent, both thinking determinedly that they would not discuss their burgeoning thirst. I wish it would rain, she said. If it would rain, I could wash my face. She ran her pointer finger alongside her nose and inspected the oil collected there. If it would rain, there would be no bonfires tonight. If it rains, we'd better find a way to collect the water, else we will not last until the prince arrives. The grandfather glanced at her. Rampion, he began, reluctant to destroy her dreaming hope. No, don't say it. He is coming. He's a smart man, a wise man. He won't risk coming until the plague runs its course. If he can come, that is. The plague may have taken the whole country, Ramp. Perhaps the whole world. Like the pestilences centuries ago. Perhaps... Don't say it, she whispered. Perhaps... He continued doggedly. The prince has caught the plague as well. Don't say that, Rampion said, eyes gleaming. I cannot afford the water to pay for tears. I am sorry, Ramp. I am old... And I've seen too much of death lately. And I am so worried for you. Gilpin will come. She closed her eyes to hold the water in. Prince Gilpin, the grandfather corrected. Etiquette? At a time like this? It borders on treason to forego the respect due your sovereign. She opened her mouth to speak, but no words came. 
She looked at him searchingly, then fled to the eastern parapet. From the rafters, the stork shook herself to life in a flutter of white. There is something she's not telling me, Gothel, the grandfather said. The stork flew out to the western parapet. But that is fair. There's so much we're not telling her. When Rampion returned to the clavier room, the grandfather said, Ramp, perhaps it is time we shared our secrets. He startled her, but her voice was steady when she asked, What do you think I'm keeping secret? He took a breath and asked, What lies between you and the prince? She said, blushing in a way that belied her answer. There's nothing. I've only ever seen him on the quarter days when he comes to pay his stipend and inspect the bells. Have you ever been alone with him? No, she said, and again her voice did not waver. Well, not more than the time it takes to greet him at the bottom of the stairs and climb here with him. Or, did you think all the times we arrived at a breath meant something sinister? He laughed, <laughs> and her eyes narrowed. Don't worry, she said. I've kept myself chaste, and now I will die chaste. But you'll forgive me if I do not right now see the value in it. He laughed again, <laughs> but said immediately, Forgive me. You have learned to speak the unvarnished truth. It puts me in mind of your grandmother. Huh. It was not like him to laugh at her. Usually he listened to anything she said with respect. It worried her, and she wondered what changed him more, starvation or witnessing the horrors of the blood death. So, she said, You thought I was the prince's mistress, did you? You would not be the first young girl of the city to be seduced by a prince. The prince's grandfather had a hundred by blows. She shook her head. It cannot be easy to raise a royal bastard. It would never be my choice. And I would never leave the Campanile. Not for Simon the Butcher, not for Gilpin the Prince. She spoke fiercely, but her eyes were moist. There's nothing, Grandpa. Just a lot of wishing on my part. He is so kind. When I go down to let him into the tower, we talk for a moment before climbing up. He seems to be interested in what I have to say. About the bells? About the bells, your health, what I hear at the well, the places I saw when I traveled with mother and father. So you remember somewhat about your father then? This startled her, for they never spoke of her father. I remember somewhat, yes. I remember his eyes were narrow like mine, and dark. I remember his voice and the way he made Mother laugh. I remember the steps where we lived and how he loved them and the key cries of the sacred falcons he called to him. She stopped abruptly when the stork entered from the west parapet. Our visitor returns. Leave her be, Ramp. She stared at the bird for a moment, half convinced the bird was here to see her, then looked away. I'll try not to mind. Now it is time for you to divulge your secret. To Rampian's surprise, the stork stepped towards her grandfather, staring at him like he was a fish it wished to catch. Her grandfather appeared frozen, staring back at the bird. Come now, Rampion said. I told you to so sharp it cut me as it left my mouth. Her grandfather looked away from the bird and shook himself. Have you ever... He began, and the stork drew closer, her body drawn up tight as though getting ready to peck him. He said quickly, I believe this stork is your mother. Sent from heaven to be with us in this trying time. The stork flew into the rafters. Rampion looked from her grandfather to the stork, who clack-clacked at her once before tucking her head under a wing to rest. She turned back to the old man, took up the edge of her sleeve to wipe the sweat gently from his face, and said, I do not think you have slept in many days. I've napped here and there. Tonight, I am putting you on your pallet again. You must sleep. He shook his head, but asked instead, how many days since the water ran out? Yesterday morning. Do you not remember? Two mornings more, then, he murmured, and her heart paused. Are we going to die, then? She asked in a tiny voice. He turned his fierce, light eyes on her, cupped her cheek in his tough old hand, and said, You've been a good apprentice to me, sweetheart, and I have been a selfish old man. I never meant to trap you in this tower. Your mother... He looked to the rafters. My mother is not a stork, Rampion said fiercely. Peace, Ramp, peace. Before she died, she told me... Told you what? Never mind, he said. I think perhaps I could nap for a bit. 
She moved him to the pallet, and he slept within moments. She went to the eastern parapet and stared for a long time at the city gate. She knew what her mother had told him. She was a witch, just like her mother, just like her father, too. She was a witch to be harrowed and hunted. The promise of a life of peace in the bell tower was a beautiful lie, shattered not by the plague alone, but also by what she was at her core, witch, enchantress, sorceress, devil's consort. She knelt on the stone of the parapet, hands clasped, and prayed. She prayed for a cool breeze, for water, for an end to the plague, for the arrival of Gilpin, for her own soul. Only when she slid prostrate to the flagstones did her mind quiet. For a moment, in the space between waking dread and sleeping peace, she thought she felt the prince's gentle hands on her waist and his loving voice in her ear. Even as she slept, she knew it was a dream. Morning bled into hot day, day bled into mad night, and night bled onto the cobbles of the square. The grandfather watched from the lunette, while Rampion's thirst cries pierced the night, louder to her grandfather than the cries of the plague dead in the square. The next night, the grandfather gave in. He let Rampion lay him on his pallet while she still had enough strength to move him. He told her he did not expect to get back up, but when he woke to early morning darkness, he was clear-eyed and clear-minded, the white shape of the stork perched in the rafters above. The noise from the square seemed less. He thought, Perhaps the plague will run itself out before we die of thirst. But then, perhaps the bells would turn themselves upside down and magically fill with water. There were many opportunities for miracles in the world, and none of them likely. Water. Came Rampion's moan from the bell room above. Water. She cries in her sleep. The grandfather said to the stork, who glided on noiseless wings to the narrow stairs leading to Rampion's little room. Gotha looked back and rapped her beak on the stones of the stairs. Clack, clack. Water! Rampion! The grandfather called. Awaken, dear heart! Clack, clack, clack. Then the insistent rapping of beak against stone again. You wake her! The grandfather said. Your legs work! Clack. The old man groaned and rolled off the pallet onto his stomach. Using elbows and hands, he pulled himself across the floor to the stork, stopping several times to pant and curse, head throbbing. The clavier room had, for the many years of his confinement, seemed small and cramped, but was now immense. He seemed to fall into a dark well for a moment. When he returned to the world, the darkness outside the windows had turned bright gray. Above, Rampion still cried for water in her sleep. He hauled himself up the stairs, step by painful step. The journey took forever. And yet it took no time. When he reached Rampion's pallet, he barely had the strength to reach for her. She sat bolt upright at his touch, screaming. Ramp! He cried, trying to push himself up and failing. She stopped screaming, shook herself hard, and even went so far as to slap herself on the cheek. Grandpa? You had a nightmare. Every night for a week. She said with asperity. This seemed worse. She smacked her lips. I'm so thirsty. She whimpered. I know. He pushed over onto his back and lay gasping, staring up at the bells. He had not seen them in many a year, not since his legs had failed, and he had made the clavier room his home. Play the carillon, he said at last. What? No. They'll know we're up here. Your father came to me in a dream. A fever dream. I have dreamed too. We need water. He told me, you must play the carillon. Then they'll know we're here. Her voice shook with fear. It's close to dawn, and they do not move much in the day. Mayhap we should have trusted to our stout doors before now. For we do not live without the bells. We merely survive. There was a glimmer of joy in her voice when she spoke. I could play. The joy died. No, I can't carry you, and I'm not going to leave you up here alone. Her voice trailed off. He knew. She thought he would die if she left him. And perhaps he would. The grandfather looked up at her bells, thinking, with some peace. At least I'll die in the sight of them. Play them, he said. For me, for yourself. She ran down the stairs without another word, and shortly the assumption rang. The oldest bell in the carillon, cast three hundred years before Rampion's birth. Next, the Saint Sebastian was called, then the crucifixion, and the kind mother, all in sequence, 
and the grandfather recognized the beginning of a piece he had written for Rampion's birthday years before. As she played, a new note rose beneath the music, a deeper bass note that did not fade and die. It was thunder, a long promising roll of thunder. The grandfather gave an exultant shout that was lost immediately in the thunder and the bells, then lay still, letting the paean wash over him in waves. He closed his eyes. If the plague dead broke down the doors and came for them, he had no wish to know. The grandfather felt a faint wetness on his face. He opened his eyes. It was raining. Rampion played one more piece before running out into the rain with a sheet held over her head. She brought the soaked linen up to her grandfather, and they sucked at the corners greedily, twisting the fabric until water dripped into their mouths. It tasted like soap and lavender and life. She ran back to set out all their cook pots and bowls, an old barrel left by the men who patched the roof, even their cups and candlestick holders. Then she laid out all of their clothes, draping them on the parapets to be washed clean. Then they drank. They drank and drank and drank. As soon as a cup or bowl gained even a few sips, Rampion brought it in and shared it. With a sudden, abundant source of water, they would have made themselves sick, and they knew it. This way, they agreed, was better. It rained for an hour. The thunder had died away only a few moments after Rampion stopped playing, but they didn't care. They would live a few more days at least. Rampion helped her grandfather downstairs to the clavier room again, made strong by hope as much as water. She settled him in his chair, brought a towel in from the rain and wiped him clean with it, then went back out onto the east parapet to do the same for herself in privacy. She stared out over the rooftops at the city gate for a moment, wondering if it would ever open again. Back in the clavier room, she found that the stork had returned and lain a flopping trout at her grandfather's feet. Fresh from the canal, her grandfather said. You could have fed us all along, Gothel. Clack, clack. You always did like to sharpen your tongue on me, daughter, he muttered. But he grinned, so pleased was he not to be dying anymore. Grandpa, Rampion rebuked, but built a fire in the hearth anyway. Soon the fish was cooking, and she hovered over it, watching the progress avidly. We'll save the bones for soup, she said, and their stomachs growled in tandem. Into the silence between them, her grandfather began. Your father was... He was just a man, Rampion said, staring into the fire without looking up. Was he? Was your mother just a woman? Rampion hugged herself against the newly chilly breeze and did not speak. Before your mother died, she told me that your father could summon wind with his flute, her grandfather said. Stop it, Grandpa. You played the carillon and the rain came. You were born among your father's people. Such... Gifts are not rare among them, and I understand that some seek them a purpose, earning them through a long fast without water. I live now with my mother's people, she said. I know that men and women with such gifts may earn a burning without even lifting a finger. Rampion stood up. My mother died, and she didn't come back to us as a stork, because if that stork were my mother, she wouldn't have let us starve for seven days. She wouldn't have let us nearly die. Not even to give you the ability to save us? The grandfather asked. The ability to save the city? It's not witchcraft, Rampion said stubbornly. No one is calling you a witch. It wasn't witchcraft, she repeated. Now? Can't we talk of something else? Or maybe nothing at all? He subsided. They ate. The stork brought fish again at noon, and with it a sheaf of greens— Rampion was silent as she sorted and cleaned them. What are they? Her grandfather asked. Ramps. She said shortly. I don't want to waste water to boil them, so we'll eat them as salad. Ramps, also called Rampion. Your mother ate ramps every day that she was pregnant with you, her grandfather said. I know. She snapped. After she served their meal, she pointed to the two vessels which held their collected water. It's not enough for a week. It will keep us longer than we thought we'd live, the grandfather said. And you could play the carol on and make it rain again. Certainly. I'll make the rain fall, destroy the plague, summon the prince back to the city, and become his princess. All by pounding on a few batons that I've pounded every day for the past five years to no spectacular effect. Certainly. The grandfather's face was a mask of sympathy. He said gently, I didn't understand the half of what your mother was. And I never knew your father. But there's magic in the world. 
and you have a share in it. I can't explain more than that. I am just a caroleneur with no magic of my own. Rampion stared at him for a moment, realizing he loved her too much to understand what she feared. She smiled with only a little bitterness. You have a magic, she said. A grandfather magic that makes you magically stubborn and magically persistent. She ate her half of the trout quickly and went out onto the parapets to watch the city gates and to dry their clothes and to avoid saying anything further that might hurt her grandfather or herself. At sunset, the city gates opened and a small mounted retinue entered the city. The prince had returned. Rampion was frozen for a moment, watching his ghoul's banner snapping in the sunlight. Then she ran to tell her grandfather, turning his chair to watch the armed retinue wend its way through the city streets. They've seen battle, Rampion said. I see a flash of bandage here and there, and their armor looks dented. Is there war on top of all of this? The grandfather had no chance to answer. From the shadows of Crookleg Alley, one of the plague dead leaped onto the neck of one of the horses and gnawed at it furiously. The horse reared, dropping its rider to the muck-covered street, while the man of the retinue turned crossbows on the plague-dead man. A bolt went through the shoulder, another through the head. The plague-dead man dropped away and died the final death. I think not war, her grandfather said. They appear well accustomed to the plague-dead. The retinue wore scarves across their faces and held weapons to the ready. They turned away from the bell tower central square towards the palace and the still flying flag of the prince's mother. Weren't you going to ring a peal if the prince returned? Rampion blushed. It seems silly now. Of course he has come for his mother, not me. And it near sunset. Better he were indoors. The grandfather thought it might hearten the prince to hear the bells, but he did not say so. He also thought that Rampion did not wish to risk witchcraft again by playing the bells. <laughs> They lost track of the prince's party when it moved into the shadows of the taller buildings near the palace. Then the stork brought another fish, a dace fresh from the canals, and the caroliners were busied with dinner. The sun was fully set when they finished the dace and the last of the ramps. They both went to look into the square again. It's harder to bear now that I feel safe and alive again, the grandfather said. And though Rampion felt neither fully safe nor fully alive, she understood. She put her hand on his shoulder, and he covered her hand with his. They watched together as new actors assembled below to enact the old play. Plague dead crept from the shadows, dragging their unwilling prey, rats and cats, men and women, other plague dead, to cook them over their bonfires. Why do we watch? Rampion asked. I owe the innocents my witness, the grandfather said at length. When I meet them in heaven, I will be able to say I didn't turn away. Rampion drew up a chair and sat beside him while he continued to speak, the words coming haltingly and yet sometimes tumbling over one another. I don't mean for you to think that you have to watch, child, he said, his voice the same strong, rumbling voice she'd loved since he first told her stories in it. Not everyone need be a witness. Below them, by the livid light of the largest fire yet, there was a flash of the prince's scarlet livery. The plague dead had caught a soldier, one of the prince's men. Oh no, Rambian said, a faint gasp that turned into a moan. She counted two, three, four more soldiers, and then the prince himself, bleeding, broken, dying. She leaped up, knocking her chair back, and ran to the clavier to pound her fists on the batons, hard and angry. Too many bells, too hard a ringing, a great muddy clash of music, like discordant thunder. Bell thunder became real thunder, louder and faster than the first time, and she wondered at it. The clavier room lit with blue-white light, and Rampion whipped her head back to see lightning striking in the square, and her grandfather's face bone-white in the brightness, his eyes amazed and staring. She turned back to the keyboard, drawing music out of the bells now instead of dissonance, and lightning struck with each ringing of the crucifixion. Not each strike of the batons elicited sound anymore. She wondered how many of the thin metal wires had snapped during her first powerful strikes. She thought she heard a voice in the cacophony, but attributed it to the madness of the moment and continued to play until the stork's hard beak pecked at the backs of her hands. Rampion stopped the senseless beating of the batons and spun around with her palms to ward off the bird. The bird danced back, darting behind her grandfather, whose arms were waving frantically. Play for rain! Play for rain! He screamed. 
Immediately, she turned the tune from the heavy martial beat to the light dancing tune she'd used before. Thunder and lightning gave way to a drenching downpour. The clavier room went dark as the bonfire sputtered and died. For the first time since the plague struck, a true night fell over the city. Rampion let her tune trail off, though it resounded still in her head. She fumbled her way to the banked fire of the hearth to light a lantern. The last notes of the bells faded, leaving behind the sound of rain and the cries of the captives in the square. You have saved them, her grandfather said. But they aren't yet free. She gave a hiccuping laugh that was half sob and ran for the door. She flung the bar there aside and pelted down the stairs. She debarred the doors downstairs frantically in the flickering light of her lantern. And when she finally pushed back the Campanile's brass doors, the thunder of their opening echoed around the square like cannon fire. She was wet through to the skin in seconds. Cold rain poured down in much greater quantities than during her first effort. She tripped across the body of a plague-dead man and screamed, but he did not move. She shined her lantern on him. His skin was black and burned, and his flesh still smoked. Lightning? Her lightning? She cast the lantern's beam around, and everywhere she saw plague-dead creatures who must have been killed by lightning. The memory of the stentorian measures of her first piece echoed again in her head, and thunder rolled in the distance. She banished those notes immediately, humming the dancing tune to herself. The thunder died away again. The first of the plague dead's captives that she found had already passed beyond. Rampion moved past the young woman in blood-soaked rags and found another young woman, still tied to a cooking stake, but largely unharmed. Her eyes were huge and pleading. When Rampion untied her, she wept. Help me, Rampion said. Help me rescue the others. And she did. They worked quickly together. The young woman wouldn't leave the circle of Rampion's wavering lantern light, and though most of the captives that they untied were nearly insensate, some were aware enough to aid them. The lower rooms of the Carillon could hold them all, Rampion decided, and she urged them to take refuge there. Most did. Some did not, preferring to instead risk further encounters with the plague dead in the darkness in pursuit of their homes and loved ones. Through it all, Rampion searched for the scarlet liveries of the prince's men. The first soldier she found caused her heart to stop for a moment. He was burned, cooked already, and his limbs and face were gnawed past recognition. It was only desperate hope that made Rampion decide that it was not Prince Gilpin at first. But after a moment, she realized that his body was the wrong shape entirely, being too blocky. It was the first young woman rescued by Rampion that found the prince. Your Highness! Rampion heard the woman exclaim and turned to see her sink into a curtsy. He was an indistinct figure tied to a cooking stake at the far end of the square, and Rampion was bearing a child towards the safety of the Campanile while the young woman untied the prince. She heard the low murmur of his voice, and saw the future with sudden stinging clarity. He would marry this woman, grateful to her for his rescue, while Rampion lived alone in her bell tower for all time. The child cried in Rampion's arms, and she hurried her steps. Inside the Campanile's doors, a soldier and a nun took the boy from her, and she turned immediately back to the chaos and the madness of the square. She passed the prince on the way back. He was aiding one of his soldiers, and the young woman was tripping alongside, looking dazed and far happier than she should. Rampion was nearly past, when the prince's hands shot out and gripped her arm. Rampion, he said, and stopped. They regarded each other, trying to see faces made indistinct by the shadows in the rain. That was your playing I heard before the thunder. He'd always been able to discern her efforts from her grandfather's. Yes, your highness. I owe you a debt, I think. He released her arm and she went on. When those who lived were secure, the prince ordered the Campanile locked. Just in time, for the rain, amazingly, had increased in strength, and there was water up to Rampion's ankles flowing through the square before the brass doors were barred again. She stood for a moment in the stairwell, watching the prince and the strongest of the survivors organize the others into neat rows in the lower rooms of the bell tower, the rooms that her grandparents had lived in when her mother was young, and her grandfather's legs could still climb stairs. She turned away when she saw they had no need of her and trudged upwards to tell her grandfather of what had happened in the square. Rampion had changed into clothes still damp from their earlier washing, and fallen asleep against her grandfather's knee when the carolineur heard a set of footsteps climb the steps to the clavier room. My liege, the grandfather said, dropping chin to chest, 
his best seated bow. Johannes, said the prince warmly, wearily. It is good to see you alive and well, my liege. And you, Johannes, said the prince. He looked down at Rampion, still asleep. You are wondering, perhaps, about the bells. The prince gave the grandfather an assessing glance. I remember the rumors about your daughter before she ran away. And the new rumors when she returned. Ah, the old man said, and wondered how he would save his granddaughter from the accusations that most certainly would follow. I've dreamed of Rampion often in recent weeks, said the prince. I wondered what it meant. I think now, perhaps, it was God's message that she would save my life. Rampion came awake without stirring, her dark eyes opening to look at the prince. He held a hand out to her. Will you watch the moon rise with me on the parapet? She blushed and took it. Excuse us, Grandpa, she said. They stepped out onto the eastern parapet, leaving the grandfather alone with his thoughts once more. They did not stay out as long as he expected, and when they returned, their hands were still joined. I beg you to have a seat, my liege, the grandfather said, eyeing them. I do not think you should call me liege, Johannes, if I am to call you grandfather now. Or grandpa, as Ramp says. The prince's eyes gleamed. The grandfather had always liked his patron's sense of humor. Until now. I see the way of it, the grandfather said. And he did. Who would be an apprentice Carolyn Ewer when she could be a princess? At least the prince would marry the girl. No prince would call his mistress's grandfather grandpa. Seeing the concern on his face, Rampion laughed as clearly and as joyfully as the ringing of the St. Barbara, the grandfather's favorite bell of the first octave. You'll see, Grandpa, she said. And they all saw when the morning dawned. The hard rain kept up all through the night and the next day, and the next night, a cold autumn rain, driving so hard that it flooded the streets and swept away the blood and filth. When the rain stopped and the waters receded, the city was clean and the plague gone. The prince ordered a peal to alert the city that all was safe again, and the citizens came forth, those that had not fled before the plague, or contracted it, or been dragged from their homes by the plague dead. The grandfather took great joy in seeing far more people alive than he had expected. The Carolineurs were not the only ones adept at hiding. Rampion stayed in the bell tower and cared for her grandfather, abandoning her open-air summer room beneath the bells for her cozy winter room beneath the clavier at night. The prince joined them for their evening meals. On the third night after his liberation, he brought plans which he and Rampion showed the grandfather together. Here's what my architect has thought up, said the prince, pointing to the important part, the bell tower. You're building a new campanile? the grandfather asked. No, Grandpa, he said. I'm building a new palace around this campanile. Rampion would not leave the bells, n nor should she. They are her tools. Then you know, the grandfather said. Don't, Rampion said. The prince raised an eyebrow. What is there to know? What is there to say? He leaned down to place an easy kiss on Rampion's temple. There will be stories for generations about the carolineurs of this city, but in the end it will be called the miracle of the bells and my princess will be but a part of the story. Cast as savior rather than witch. He spoke tenderly, and the grandfather was well satisfied. He was a good man, and a wise prince. Let me put you to bed, Grandpa, Rampion said when he'd left. As she settled the grandfather onto his pallet, she looked to the rafters. But where's the stork? She left some time in the night. You're really going to marry him? Be a princess? She smiled mistily. I'm going to marry Gilpin. The rest is meaningless. Simon will be sore disappointed when he returns. Oh, certainly, she said. Because Simon had a chance otherwise. She tucked blankets around his feet. Simon wouldn't have moved his butcher shop to the bell tower. Well, I wouldn't have wanted him to. I'm none so sure about this palace either. Sometimes I think you like to be grumpy for the sake of being grumpy. A week ago, we were dying... Now I am the heroine of the city, a princess in waiting, and you get your wish. I will never leave the bells. What more do you want? What more can you want? Shall I have Gilpin make you a lord and move you to the countryside? No, the grandfather said, looking at the clavier. 
You know where my heart lies. That I do, Rampion said. They sat in silence for a moment. The stork left because she knew all would be well, the grandfather said at last. And all will be well, Rampion said, leaning forward to kiss his forehead. For a time, for the rest of your lifetime, and for a good deal of mine. And it was. Author's Note Hi, I'm Mary Haskell. I hope you enjoyed my story, Rampion in the Bell Tower. I've nearly always lived in towns with carillons. I could see Duke University's chapel tower from the second floor of my house growing up, and right now I can poke my head outside of the library where I work and see the Burton Bell Tower at the University of Michigan. I grew up hearing bells, and I grew up eating fairy tales. Fairy tale retellings are nearly my favorite subgenre to read between Robin McKinley and Tanith Lee. I started rewriting fairy tales when I was a kid, but it wasn't until I was well into adulthood that I actually finished one and felt semi-satisfied with it. A good retelling seems to me to be a bit mythical, a bit surreal, and a bit creepy. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this story. Stop by and see me at maryhaskell.com, M-E-R-R-I-E-H-A-S-K-E-L-L.com. I'd love to hear from you. Okay, welcome back. Hope you enjoyed the story. I certainly did. She has 47 pounds of cats. Yeah, that's a lot. Do you think that's one really, really fat cat, or does she just have a lot of cats? Oh, I think it's just, you know, like hamburger meat on the cat. <laughs> She's got a freezer full. <laughs> that's a grisly, grisly thought for a wonderful, nice, uplifting Christmas podcast. This is our Christmas podcast. Yeah, I think it's the last one we'll get out before Christmas, if we even manage to get it out in time. Oh, you know, I, I would have prepared something if I'd known today was Christmas. I, I didn't get you anything. Well, we, we have our Dune Steve Christmas party coming up uh, at the end of the week, so you still have a little time. The white elephant gift. and Wow, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. If I recall, last year we didn't have one. That no, we did. You just got so drunk, you, you can't remember it. No, no, no. no. That, that's real life is what we're talking about here. No. In the, as far as the Dune Steve, I don't think we existed last year. Oh, that's right. That, that was back when we just published manga. Now, which one is manga? Is manga the one with tentacles? I think manga. it's Japanese for comic book. And it goes backwards. I think you have to read backwards on it. Oh, see, I it's, thought it was, it was backwards a... because in Japan, man come first. And woman comes second. <laughs> and sometimes not at all. Anyhow, I think we've been talking for a long, long time, and I'm fairly sure we're going to have to edit all of this. Yeah, well, a lot of that's going to have to go, I believe. Hey, R O D T. Hey, R O D. Just say O A O T. Hey, O A O T. O A O T. He's back to ignoring me. Can you have him edit all this out, please? Uh, ed- edit that out, would you? <laughs> Oh, okay. That'll work. Wait, what is he saying? Oh, uh, he'll edit out anything that makes me look dumb. Okay, that's good. Is it, well, the, that makes you look dumb. What, what, us look dumb? I don't know. It just says me. I don't know if that means us. Mm. So this is our Christmas, our holiday, our Chanaka podcast. Uh-huh. And Rampion in the Bell Tower. Was there a particular reason why you chose this one for holiday? Uh... <laughs> Not a good reason. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I picked it because, uh, you know, it does have some some religious images in it, some religious stuff to it. It's basically that. I don't know. What, do you, what did you think? Was it a bad choice, good choice? No, it's fine. I just uh, had thought maybe because Bells was in the title and people associate oh. Bells with... Yeah. Chris- oh, wait, Bells Silver is not Bells. in the title. Right, but Bells is not in the title. It is. Rampion in the... Well, Bell Tower... Mm. It's a good story. That's why I chose it. I like the story. No, no, and that's that's all you need. So we got a website. It's www.dunesteef.com. That's D-U-N-E-S-T-E-E-F, where you can find links to to Mary Haskell's site. Also on the site, we have uh, our submission guidelines. If you want to submit a story to us, uh, you can take a look at that and find out how to send us a story. Um, we really love to get really good stories, so if you've got a really good story, please send it along. Well, can, can I interrupt you for a second? Oh, sure. Okay, the website is, is dunesteef.com, right? right. 
Uh-huh. I, I'm kind of embarrassed. I mean, we've do, been doing this show a couple of weeks now, months uh-huh. now. We've been doing it for several days, I know. And I, I'm not quite sure what Dune Steve means. I'm glad you asked that question, Rish, because it's an interesting story. Many years ago, on a cold winter night, just like this one, a young man named Anklevich... You, you know what? I, I changed my mind. I, I don't want to know. Hmm. But uh, there are guidelines on the website. Right, right. People can read that, determine if their story fits, and send it on. Mm-hmm. Uh, you already said the email address? Submissions at doonsteve.com. Yeah, and also on that website, we've got a donation button. Actually, we've got several. You can click any one of those donation buttons. And when you donate to the podcast, you're not giving your money to Rish or to Big or even to 08 OT. You're giving your money to the authors that provide you with this wonderful entertainment of these stories that are, come to you each fortnight or so. <laughs> That's right. We're paying market. And we try to uh, put those donations to good use. If, if you'd send one our way, uh, somebody like Mary Haskell would benefit from it. That's right. She'd be able to buy Christmas presents for her children. Uh, I don't well, know. For if, her. Oh, yeah. Many, her, many cats. For her cats. I, yeah, I was going to say, I don't know if she has children. She has but, a stepdaughter. Does she? Did she say that? Well, the last year's Christmas party, she mentioned to me. No, uh, I think she said so in her. <laughs> hey, 08 OT. 08 OT! Can you have him edit this out, please? Uh, oh, wait, OT, will you edit that stuff out? What is his deal? Must be, must have had a bad day. All right, I mean, everybody has a bad day. True. Um, now and again. Yeah, it's hard to deal with those people you don't like. Yeah. I... Wait, why are you looking at me? <laughs> well, you know, it is the holidays, so I should try and put my bad feelings behind me. Okay. Uh, what, what, what do you think of the Christmas season? Are you a fan? You know... I I am a fan. I'm I'm a fan of whatever holiday you like to celebrate around this time. Everybody's got their own, it seems. And you can make up one if you don't have one. I th- I think that flies these days. You know, I grew up in a household with a lot of children in my family. And so we didn't really have a lot of money. And so I didn't get a lot of stuff very often. So Christmas was a really big deal. It wasn't like, oh, yeah, I just went to the toy store and bought a bunch of crap last week, but this week I get some more because it's Christmas. It was one of the very few times, basically, Christmas, my birthday, that I'd get anything, you know. So it was really cool when Christmas came around. During the year, maybe I could scrounge up two ninety nine to go to the Toys R Us and, and buy a Star Wars guy, but uh, that was about as far as I got. And so when Santa Claus brought me a TIE fighter for Christmas, it was awesome. Or when he brought me the X-Wing fighter, it was pretty cool. And Santa used to do interesting things in my household. Did he have grabby hands? No, he, he, would, he would do things like set up treasure hunts or something where you come downstairs and go to the tree and your present wasn't like just under the tree. You had to, like with your stocking was a clue and you kind of had to follow these clues until you actually found where your present was hidden at, which was kind of fun, I thought. What about you, Rish? Do you, uh, do you enjoy Christmas season? Oh, you know, I don't know. Uh, in my old age, I don't, I've become more and more convinced that Christmas is for kids. Okay. But it's all about the children. The uh-huh. children. Think of the children. That's right. Think of them. But not that way, sir. R O T, can you edit this part out? I don't know. I'm I'm kind of a bah humbuggy kind of person. Uh, I didn't put up any lights this year. I'm really behind on my shopping, and it's kind of a drag to ask people what they want for Christmas, unless they're kids, because it's nice to see the kid open the present and not know yeah. what it's going to be. And that. It's fun. One time my, my son opened the present, and he opens it up, and he goes, oh, Superman Jet is what I always wanted, which I thought it was really – he said that again. For another present a little later, but I thought it was really cute to hear him say it's what he always wanted when he maybe wanted it a month. But, you know, he was a kid and he enjoyed it. You know, at Christmas 1987, there, that was a special Christmas because uh, my mother brought home a little baby brother. Oh. But uh, 
he didn't fit, so we took him back and traded him for a Nintendo. Oh, sweet. And that was such a great present, dude. Sweet. Uh, if I had, like, a dime for every hour I spent playing Super Mario Brothers, I could probably press the button. Yeah. And then you, of course, mentioned Star Wars. And, yeah, my favorite Christmas memory was Christmas, The Return of the Jedi came out, 83. And, yeah, that was the big Star Wars Christmas for me. Uh-huh. Where I had asked everybody <laughs> for Star Wars guys and my friends and I got together. We talked about what everybody had gotten. And, I mean, it was just so amazing. And we all had the same interest. And, and there were so many Star Wars guys that not everybody got the same. And he's like, oh, and he got this and I got this. And, oh, that was the best Christmas. Yeah, that's cool. What about you, O8OT? Do you like Christmas a lot? <laughs> oh, really? What did he say? He says his favorite memory is it's the year that Rish Outfield got run over by a tractor and dragged for 40 feet and spent the entire Christmas season in the hospital. That never happened. <laughs> well, he's a new robot. Uh, we got him this year, so this is his first Christmas. So he's talking about Christmas 2008. Dude, you know, I can't help but feel threatened by comments like that. Okay, you're a robot, right? 080T. Isn't there some kind of three rules, the Asimov rules that prevent you from doing harm to a a human being? Something like that? (laughs) He says it's time you start living in the real world, Rish. That was a movie. And not a very good one. (laughs) Oh, there, there was a really cool thing that happened this week. Let me guess, you, you ordered a replacement for our OT. Uh, you know, I, you sent me that email. I looked into it, but seriously, the new models are way more expensive, especially since we never get donations. So not going to happen. But no, actually, what did happen was uh, one of our favorite podcasts sent us out an email. Norm Sherman at the Drabblecast sent us out an email, and he wanted us to read some lines for one of his stories over at the Drabblecast. So, uh, of course, you know, we rushed and got it done as fast as we could, sent it over to him, and he managed to get it in. And it's up and online now. Okay, so... Norm is amazing. Seriously, uh, it's so cool to be on the Drabblecast. Isn't that great? Yeah. I, I'm I'm about ready to just quit our podcast and try and full time do the Drabblecast. You know, I try and I try for our podcast to be good. Oh wait, OT, play the uh, sad music. And you know, we 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 come up with a little bit of banter and we we work hard on these stories and 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 and, and I think that they're good and nobody cares. And and look, Norm Sherman had a half an hour to edit what we sent him, and he had it done. You and I, we're recording this August of 2006. <laughs> and it's not going to make it in time. I just, yeah, it's one It'll of those It'll come things. out on December 28th. I'll be like, Merry <laughs> Christmas in May. Boy, that new Harry Potter movie was good. Dumbledore died. Oh, shoot. Well, hey, thank you, Norm, for uh, allowing us to participate. If John Smith, you're listening drabblecast.org check out the story yeah that's right i even had 080t install a button on our website so you can check that out click right on there and give it a listen and what was the story called the story was called squidges (laughs) isn't that a wonderful word you know i don't feel so well you're feeling rather grinchy now aren't you you want christmas to go away christmas wish it would be a brand new robot that speaks english and doesn't suck Answered our emails and read through the submissions and picked out the ones that it knew we would like. Made sure people pressed the button and uh, had breasts. Yeah. Well, Big, if you could have one wish, what would you wish for? If I could have one Christmas wish, I would just wish for you and 080T to get along. That's all I want. Well, I, I, you know, I don't know that miracles actually happen outside <laughs> of television. But it'll save you money. You won't have to buy me a present that way. All right, I'll work on that. <laughs> I'll see what I can do, young man. <laughs> oh, hey, hey, hey. How about you, announcer man? Do you, uh, do you have any special Christmas wish? The hate letter of the week. Oh, come on. That's not a Christmas wish. That's, that's just cruel.
T- no, tell us your Christmas wish. It's time for the hate letter of the week. Ah, uh, fine. I think it's your turn to uh, read the hate letter. Uh, oh, 08OT says that you should read it. No, 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 no. I, I did it last time, and it was it was cruel, and I didn't. What is he saying? He says you're being a baby. I'm not being a baby. Fair is fair. He says quit being a baby. All right, fine. Dear Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine, I am a new listener to your podcast, but I recently went back and checked out all the back catalog. I like the story selection and the music. Wow. I think your readings have been getting better and better, and your banter is improving. Oh, cool. All right, I'll read on. I hope you continue to produce good audio stories well into the new year. Keep up the good work. Sincerely, Jonas S. Grumby. <laughs> oh, look at that. Hey, th- you know what? That's pretty great. Yeah, Thank your, you, announcer man. Your Christmas wish came true. <laughs> oh, oh, wait, O.T. says that there's still some more to read. Oh, in the letter? Okay. P.S. Please have Big Anklevich read this letter. Do not show it to Rish Outfield. He is a douche. (laughs) Keep those Carson letters coming, folks. All right, well, we've come to the end of our show. Chestnuts are roasting on the open fire, and it's time for us to go. We'd like to wish you a happy holidays, a happy Hanukkah, a happy Kwanzaa, and a happy Christmas. I'm still recovering from that that (laughs) nasty letter. So please have a uh, wonderful holiday. Don't drink and drive and tip your waitresses. Okay, well then, uh, this has been Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anglovich. And remember, he knows if you're sleeping. He knows if you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good. You're scaring me. So be good, for goodness sake. Okay, I will, I will. He freaked me out, man. Thank you for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you may share these files with anyone, but you may not charge for them or alter them.